welcome to this video. Now in this video we're looking at water regulation in the kidney. Now a bit of a long aim today, let's just read this carefully. Aim today is to explain using water potential terminology the control of water content in the blood with reference to the roles of the kidney, osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus and the posterior pituitary gland. That's quite a bit today and also it's quite involved. What I suggest you do is you go through this several times take your time, use other resources, but really get to grips. Sometimes you've got to go through things really carefully and understand what's going on. Let's just recap first of all a few little um, facts and figures for you here. So how much fluid do you think is filtered into the nephron every minute? Remember there are a million nephrons in every kidney? Every kidney? Hey, two kidneys? In both kidneys. So how much do you think is filtered through? Any guesses? Well, it's about 125 cubic centimetres. Now, don't forget, as soon as it's filtered through, a lot of it is going to be reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule. So, how much do you think is left after reabsorption? Any guesses? Well, it's about 45 cubic centimetres. And today, we're particularly interested in the role of the lupahenia. Now, what do you think it does? We'll think about this for a second. Okay, we're looking at reabsorption. So, probably, I think it is, yeah, it's all to the reabsorption. It's creating a low very negative water potential in the medulla tissue. Now remember your water potentials? Remember that pure water has got a water potential of zero and everything else is negative by comparison. So if it's very negative it means it's got very low water content. So what you're trying to do by creating a low water content in the medulla tissue you're trying to draw water out of the Henle into the surrounding tissue. That's the whole point. Let's look now um, just recap the structure of the kidney. Okay. A few little labels here for you. Number one, okay, over here, lost, lost a pointer, there's a pointer. Number one over here, this is the ascending loom, limb of Lupa Henley. Two is the descending limb, Lupa Henley. Three, now these are the, what they call the peritubular capillaries. Okay, they are reabsorbing the water that's been squeezed up here in number five, Bowman's capsule. Four is the PCT or proximal convoluted tubule. And six is the DCT or distal convoluted tubule. That's the basic um, structure. Let's have a think first of all what's going on. Now, the descending limb of the Lupa Henle is permeable to water. That means it allows water to pass out into the tissue. The ascending limb, by contrast, is impermeable. doesn't allow water to pass out. Now, what does happen, though, is sodium ions and Cl Cl minus ions, chloride ions, can't speak today, chloride ions are actively transported, that means energy requiring, out of the ascending limb and passively move into the descending limb. So what's happening here? They're moving out of the ascending limb, okay, into the tissue around, okay, and because you're building up a higher concentration here, they can then passively move into the descending limb here. Okay? So Sodium and chloride ions are actually transported out of the ascending limb, that's this one here, and passing move into the descending limb, that one there. Now what that does, as I said, it, it creates a concentration gradient across the medulla. So don't forget, much of the um, nephron is down here, I'll just draw it in there, is down here in the medulla. Okay, remember that from last time? Now there's a lower iron concentration gradient at the top of the ascending limb and a much higher iron concentration at the bottom. This is a bit more complex diagram here showing what's going on. Just follow it through very carefully. Notice up here the key. So up here we've got a key. I lost the point again. There it is. So if it's blue, okay, the process is water transport taking place by osmosis. If it's red, we've got active transport. If it's green, we've got diffusion of ions. So look, over here this is where you've got active transport going on. You can see that by the red arrows. So chloride and sodium ions have been actively pumped out of here. Because there's a gradient in the medulla down here, the sodium and chloride ions can passively diffuse into the descending limb here. Okay, you've got this gradient. Gradient A coming down this way. And because you've got um, a low water potential outside, water can moved by osmosis into the surrounding tissue and be reabsorbed. Okay? And that's the whole point. But let's look at this bit more detail. First of all, the descent loop of Henley water potential becomes more negative. Water is being lost by osmosis to the surrounding tissue and sodium and chloride ions are diffusing in, so you're going to have a lower water potential. In the ascending limb, 
water and sugar cane becomes less negative. Sodium and chloride are diffusing out into the tissue fluid, and up here you've got active down here. So I start again. Down here you've got diffusion of sodium and chloride ions into our tissue. Up here it gets a bit tougher. You've got to have active transport of sodium and chloride ions. Now the ascending limb water tension becomes continuous and less negative. Near top of the limb is impermeable to water. So at the top here, water doesn't move out of the ascending limb. Fluid loses salts, but not water. This is what's called a hairpin. This is a key term here. The hairpin counter current multiplier. I can't draw straight lines. Now, let's think about the words hairpin. Now, a hairpin is a shape. If you look at it, if I can draw over my diagram here, it's this sort of shape, which is like a hairpin type shape. Counter current. The current is flowing in this direction here. Okay, but basically we've got movement of salts in the opposite direction, so it's going against the current and it's multiplying the concentration of salts. So hairpin counter current multiplier, if you break it down to the words you understand more what it's about. And it increases the efficiency of salt transfer from the ascending limb into the descending limb. So we're getting the salt transfer going across this way. Okay? And this builds up the salt concentration in the surrounding tissue fluid. So all around here you get a build up of salt concentration. Now movement of sodium and chloride ions into medulla, medulla causes a lower water potential. Movement of sodium and chloride ions in medulla causes lower I just said that didn't I? Repeat myself here. Okay. The water potential becomes increasingly negative going deeper into medulla. So the further you go down into the medulla, the more negative the water potential becomes, i.e. more likely it is for water to be reabsorbed. Now at the top of the ascending limb, the urine is dilute. Water may then be absorbed in the this tube here, the distal conduit tubule, and as it goes down into the collecting duct. This is a process here called osmoregulation. Now, let's look what happens in DCT and also collecting duct. Active transport, again, requiring energy, is used to adjust the various salt concentrations. In the collecting duct, still a lot of water in here, and the idea is we're going to start absorbing some of that. So fluid contains a lot of water, i.e. a high water potential approaching zero. The tubule carries fluid from the medulla down into the pelvis, so in this direction here. I can't draw arrows either. Now the tissue fluid in the medulla, that's this area here, has a very low water potential, so water is drawn out of the collecting duct by osmosis into the surrounding blood capillaries. Okay, and the urine in the pelvis, right down at the bottom, has a very negative water potential. That means not a lot of water, exactly what we want. So the concentration of urea and salts in the urine is much higher than in the blood plasma, which is exactly what we want. Now, I'm going to talk about water balance. What's this water balance rigmarole? Well, here's a balance, if you can see that. Now, on the inside, we've got food, drink, and also metabolism. Think about the um, equation for respiration, unit liberation of water. So those are three sources there. Water, water out, well losing water in urine obviously, in your sweat, in the water vapour, the air you breathe out, and also your faeces. All these are sources of water loss. And this has to be balanced. It all depends what sort of weather we've got. Okay, on a hot day, as you know, well you might not know, but I hope you do, hot day you produce a smaller volume of urine, it's very yellow and concentrated. The walls of the collecting duct are very permeable, so more water is reabsorbed back into the blood. This is why the urine is more concentrated. Au contraire, on the opposite side, we've got a cold day. On a cold day, again, you may have noticed, you produce a large volume of urine. It's very dilute, and this must mean that the walls of the collecting duct are less permeable, so you get less reabsorption of water back into the blood. So both those things together make up water balance. And this is all under control of a hormone called ADH. ADH is anti-diuretic hormone that travels in the blood and controls it. So, let's look now this ADH stuff, shall we? I hope you recognise this. This is a cross-section through your brain here. Okay, so water potential of blood is monitored by osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus of the brain. So over here, these are back to front, aren't they? One's one way, never mind. Sure you can work it out. Here's a hypothalamus here, 
Okay, hypothalamus has got osmoreceptors and oh, I think we need a key word. Osmoreceptors are receptor cells that monitor the water potential of the blood. If the blood has a low water potential, okay, then water is moving out of the osmoreceptor cells. So low water potential, not a lot of water. Water moves out the um, osmoreceptor cells by osmosis, so they shrink, and this causes stimulation of what we call neurosecretory cells. Now these neurosecretory cells are actually neurons, they're specialized neurons, nerve cells, and they release ADH all the time from their cell body in the hypothalamus, okay, up here. So ADH is being released up here, hypothalamus all the time. Now it travels down the axon of the neurosecretory cells to the posterior pituitary gland down here where it is stored until it's needed. And when the neurosecretory cells are stimulated, remember here we talked about these osmoreceptors stimulating the neurosecretory cells. Well, when they do that, when the cells are stimulated, the stored um, ADH here in the posterior pituitary is released. So action potentials travel down the axons and ADH will be released. So look at the, um, the whole structure of this. Here's your hypothalamus. Here are your neurosecretory cell bodies here. Now they produce the ADH. The ADH, all the time it's being produced, travels down the axon to the posterior pituitary here. It's all in the brain, don't forget. Here's a brain here. There we are, up there. Okay. So ADH is traveling down the axon to the posterior pituitary. Now, it's stored there, but when the posterior pituitary receives um, stimuli from the osmoreceptors, it then releases the ADH, and the ADH then travels around the blood and it controls the permeability of the collecting duct. Let's look now at the actual process going on inside the collecting duct. Okay, here we've got fluid from distal convoluted tubule and this is going down here, the collecting duct. So urine is going down in this direction here and we want to reabsorb some of that water across this area here into the blood, okay? Right, so there we've got blood there with ADH. What happens? Well, what's the process? First of all, ADH is detected by cell surface receptors and binds to them. Here we've got these cell surface receptors here now. They recognize ADH and ADH binds to them. Secondly, what then happens is a chain of enzyme controlled reactions takes place inside the cell. So here we've got this chain here of enzyme controlled reactions inside the cell. Now these are vesicles. Now these vesicles here are very, very special. These vesicles contain water permeable channels called aquaporins. Okay? And that's these objects here. Now these here facilitate the movement of water from the collecting duct into the tissue fluid. So what then happens is they then, um, as vesicles do, migrate the membrane here, they open up the aquaporins there facilitate or ease the movement of water from here okay, into the tissue fluid, so water in this direction here so it allows more water to be reabsorbed by osmosis into the blood so less urine is produced at the low water potential, so the more of these aquaporins you've got here open the more water is going to be reabsorbed back into the blood here and what is controlling these um, aquaporins is ADH so when ADH is um, present in the blood, the ADH is picked up by the receptors there, it then results in a series of enzyme controlled reactions here, which results in these vesicles, acroporins, migrating to the inner membrane there. These acroporins allow water to be removed from the collecting duct and reabsorbed. So more ADH, more acroporins, more water reabsorbed. Now, if ADH is then reduced, if we then lose the ADH, there's now no more need for it, what then happens is new vesicles remove the channels from the membrane so less water is reabsorbed. Okay, pretty straightforward, I think. I hope you agree with that. Now, all this is, all this control, all potential in the blood is in some what we call negative feedback. Really important to understand this. And there's a little diagram here to help us. Now, it's important that you work through this yourselves. Okay? So, suppose there is um, a decrease in the water potential of the blood, i.e. we're losing water. Detected by the osmoreceptors hypothalamus, more ADH is released, collecting um, duct water more permeable, more water is reabsorbed, 
less urine is produced, so urine is more concentrated. We then get an increase in the blood water potential. Very good. However, when we get an increase in water potential of the blood, over this back of this side now, this is detected by the receptors. Okay, they tell the hypothalamus less ADH is produced, less vesicles um, and acroporins are um, stimulated. Therefore, the duct wall becomes less permeable. Therefore, less water is reabsorbed, and more urine is produced, which is more dilute. Okay, so this whole process here is a negative feedback. Now, ADH. Lastly, ADH has a half-life in blood of about 20 minutes, and it's broken down. Right, few. That is a lot to take on board. Okay. Hope you understand now what we've been doing. We've explained. We've talked about negative water potential. Water potentials. We talked about water content of blood, how we control it. We looked at the um, role of the kidney, osmoreceptors. We talked about the hypothalamus, and lastly about the posterior pituitary gland. So, a lot to take on board. Please go back to the video, watch it again, take notes, use other resources. Don't just rely on my videos and rants as I go through it. Check it out, please. Understand it, and make sure that you can actually go through the aim and say, "Yep, I feel happy with that." Okay, well, thank you for watching, thank you for listening, and I'll be back again very, very soon. Bye for now.